Hallelujah. Are you ready for the word this morning? Now we have come to the end of the year, right? And we have been, Brother Siji spoke just now. You know what I want you to think today? I'm going to talk about uh, to prepare and preparedness. Uh, even though I'm giving a little exhortation to you about the end of the year and to prepare to enter the new year. Uh, I mean, that's very, very important. So I'm just going to talk about the importance of being prepared or to prepare ourselves. Everything and in anything that we do in our world, whether you go for exams, you are getting married or you're getting a new job, you always prepare yourself to get to that place. So we are going to talk about to prepare. But uh, the end of the thing that uh, I'm going to take you through the scriptures is, in all these things, one thing is very, very important. That is anointing. Nothing, as a believer, nothing can be done without the anointing. So what I want you to get the message today is, towards the end, why I'm saying this in the beginning, so that you understand, you'll focus on one thing. It is all about anointing, and it's all about we being thirsty and hungry for anointing and this is what will prepare you for the end and that's what we're going to do but then one thing we should not forget is we are finishing this year and when you finish this year we should freshly enter into the new year and the preparation is very very important i'll take you through a few scriptures like uh, uh, some examples i want to take you the man noah the man of God, Noah. Book of Genesis chapter 6. Keep it there for you. Noah was called by God. And if you see the scriptures, God was so angry with the whole world. He wanted to destroy the whole world. Every living being he wanted to destroy. However, he found one man. And his name is Noah. He found him righteous. That's what the word of God says. And in spite of him being righteous, God could not just protect him and destroy the whole world. He gave a mandate to Noah. And he explained to him everything that's going to happen. And he made a way of salvation. In other words, protection. In other words, to, a way to escape the complete destruction that was going to come upon the whole land. And Noah had the responsibility to prepare himself. I'll take, uh, I'll quickly read a few scriptures. And uh, the scriptures is uh, uh, chapter 6 verse 13. Chapter 6 verse 13 and 14 I'm going to read. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them and the earth. The make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. He has given the details how the preparation should be for his protection. Then God also told how exactly he's going to destroy the world and how he should protect himself. Genesis, the same chapter, verse 17 and 18. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth. He made it very clear to him. To destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Because Noah was righteous, he also granted him the grace to save his household also. We have a promise in, uh, 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 in the book of uh, Acts, I think chapter 16 when uh, Paul and Silas was put in the prison, where when they, they come out they, and speak to the jailer, 
And jailer receives the Lord. What shall I do? And he says, get in, you uh, come and get, believe in Jesus Christ and be baptized. And then you and your household will be saved. So there's a promise for, the, for us today. Household will be saved. So we should live with that promise all the time. And keep claiming for the salvation of your loved ones, your family members. It's your job. Based on your, sal your salvation, based on your submission to Jesus, God will give your household too. So similar, that's a good example is Noah was righteous, but his household was saved. The thing that no God told Noah is, is going to bring flood. Destruction. There was no flood before. There's no rain before. Nothing like that. And the work given to Noah was a, a huge work, humongous uh, target, I mean, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? task. It's not easy for man to even imagine the work given to Noah. And when Noah began to build this, even though it's not written anywhere, Noah preached gospel, it's not written how many years. Many people say it's 120. I also used to think 100. Then finally began to look into it. It's uh, not written anywhere. It's 120 years. Or it's not even written. He was building the ark for 120 years. Uh, there are some few calculations you can make according to the age and so on. It still gives about 55, 65 years of calculation. And while he was building this ark... He, he, was he just quiet or did he preach gospel? This was my question last night. I began to ask. And few things that came to my heart, and I was looking also for it, and people say is, when he began this work, neighbors will come and ask him, what are you doing? What is this? What are you trying to do? And surely he would have told them, this is what's going to happen. Then what the neighbors would have done is, you must be crazy. We don't even build a house so big and you're building such, what, are, what is all this? And these kind of questions, and not only they would have just questioned him, they would have ridiculed him for what he was doing. So he would have told people, if you believe me, this is what God told me and that's what I'm trying to do because God has informed me. So all that work he was doing was for one purpose. The purpose is he was preparing himself to protect himself from the destruction of the world. It is very important for us to prepare. The preparation was big for him. The salvation came at the end. The preparation was for all those years, whether it's 50 or 60 or 70 years, whatever it may be, he had to do all this work by himself and his sons together. We know that there were no equipment there. There were no, I mean, when you talk about, when you think of this, I mean, I cannot imagine how Noah actually was able to do this work. I cannot imagine. And we don't see anywhere in the word of God, God has given any assistance to Noah to build this ark. But however, all that he was doing was, he was focused on one thing, to make this ark. The reason is, Noah had faith in God. We will find that scripture in Hebrews chapter um, Hebrews uh, uh, chapter 11 verse 7. Hebrew 11 verse 7 says, By faith Noah being divinely warned, things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness which is according to faith. Now, all of you here have faith in God, right? All of you. If you have no faith, you will not come here. I mean, you believe that Jesus is God's son. He came to this world and he died for us. And because he died for us, in his blood, our sins are washed and we are made whole. And we all believe this. We all, and that's good. So we are of faith. So because and what he makes is salvation is of faith, not by works. So he says, and the word says, he condemned the world. So those who do not believe, they are condemned. Because as Noah believed God, people in the world are not believing. Now I want to tell you something. Even in the Christian circle, people in the church, some people do not believe God the way they should believe him. 
So when he believed, the reason is, when he believed, he did something. What he believed? The flood is going to come. Now I have to build the ark. And what he did after believing, there was an action. Your faith must include action. Means you have to prepare yourself for eternity. Eternity is there, it's coming. The kingdom of God is coming. Are you and me, as the church, are we preparing for the eternity? As we prepare for the new year, that's we need to do it. But are we preparing for the eternity? Are we continuously on the job? Now, Noah was on the job every single day. I don't know for one plank, if you had to make a one plank alone to cut, it may take the whole day. Just, he has no machines. Just sawing, I know what it means to saw. I worked in my, in my uh, when I was doing my engineering, my, uh, we had to do sawing, you know, and even to saw a smith, this, this big block, it would take one hour for us just to make it one straight saw, and it still will not make it straight. It will go this way. Yeah. I know people will try to try start here. It was supposed to go. Then by the time they reached, they were already made a wedge instead of a block. But Noah had to make the planks. It was every plank, and each plank was supposed to be connected correctly. So it was a big job. So Noah was busy doing the preparation, that's what I want to bring to you. You and I need to be busy to do a preparation for eternity. Do not work hard for your day-to-day -day life on earth. Your small needs, small things, work, job, or finances, or whatsoever. Do not work for those things. Work for eternity. Do not worry for the things that are needed on earth. When Jesus spoke to us in book of Matthew chapter 6, the whole chapter towards the end, he says, do not worry about tomorrow. In other words, what he's saying, focus on the kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will come your way. Hallelujah. I mean, the, the promise is straightforward. Let's remember the word. Last week, what was the word? How can it be? It will happen because God said it. And if you are a believer who, who believes in God's word, whatever God said, that must take place in your life. Every promise will come to pass in your life. How can it be is your question? Is anything difficult for God? Is anything impossible for God? That's what is very, very important. Noah had this assurance in his heart and when he began to work he didn't feel it tired some he didn't know how many how long it's going to take he knows only once the ark is finished then the flood will come he did not say suddenly the flood will come what will happen the preparation he was doing diligently today brothers and sisters you and i had to prepare ourselves to enter the eternity so our focus in everyday life must be Eternal life, not every day. But what's the, the important thing is, while you are preparing, while you are focused on the Lord, your day-to-day -day lives are taken care of. As Now, Brother Gilbert gave us a good testimony. Yes, he was concerned. He was concerned a lot. So many months or whatsoever he was in concern. But at the right time, God just showed up and said, okay, I'll take care of this need. Because you obeyed me, I'll take care of this need. Because you trusted me, I'll take care of this need. And that's what we got to do. When it comes to preparation, we'll see some more scripture. You know, Joshua had to prepare the people of Israel before crossing the river Jordan. You'll find in Joshua 1, verse 10 and 11, it talks about this. It says, Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves. For within three days, you will cross over this Jordan to go to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving to possess. It is talking about pre preparation. Just pre prepare provisions. The reason was, once you know these people crosses to the other side, manna would stop. They won't get any more manna. So they have to prepare themselves. So everything that they had, they have to carry, make in, a, make in such a way, once they, 
land on the other side, they have food for themselves. So preparation was necessary to enter the, 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 the promised land. And so the, these people, these soldiers went and spoke out to them and they prepared them. And they were supposed to be prepared to cross the river also. Similarly, we also see in Exodus chapter 19, Moses prepared the people of Israel to see and hear God. Exodus chapter 19, verse 10 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. And on the third day, the Lord will calm down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. They were supposed to consecrate themselves. In other words, preparation includes consecration. The meaning for consecration is separating yourselves from the rest of the world. Consecration is separating yourselves and setting apart yourself for the kingdom of God or for the Lord Himself. So this is what these people said. For them, it was commanded they should wash their clothes. Today, it is commanded for us to wash ourselves in the blood of Lord Jesus Christ. Continuously. It's a continuous process because in our day-to-day -day life, we do things that does not please God. But if you approach the blood which is available for you, that's why it said 1 John 1, seven, the blood of God, Jesus cleanses us, cleanses us, no, cleanses us, means continuously cleansing us until the day we reach the Lord. The, own, the, the, the way you get cleansed is by approaching the blood and receiving the cleansing by confessing our sins. The next verse, ninth verse, talks about confess your sins and your sins will be forgiven. Amen? So this consecration is needed. Now, for the preparation to enter a new season or a new realm, you have to consecrate yourselves. I'm, as I'm talking about the, if you're going, going to the, enter the new year, spend some time. Take time to pray. You can decide how many days you want to pray or, a, or how many days you want to fast. Normally, we declare fast for the whole church last six days. From 26th onwards, we declare six. I do not know how many of you fast. But we also call you to come and pray together. We also come and ask you to come and share your testimonies and so on. That is very important. So you want to get to a new place, new realm, a new time. You must prepare yourself. That's what I ask you to do. And the person who is preparing, that person you will know. The person who is preparing himself, you will know. You will know them by their fruit. He will be a fruit-bearing person. In other words, he will show Jesus or the works of Jesus in his day-to-day -day life. And if you don't bear fruit, you are not actually in preparation. And the Word of God says, Matthew chapter 25, Jesus taught us about the parable of virgins. They were asked to be continuously prepared, not just prepared at once. Let me read this for you. Book of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 1 onwards. I'll read the story. Let's understand. The parable of wise and foolish virgins. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. When they're called virgins, means all are qualified. All are virgins. There was nothing wrong about them. The way they thought was different. One group of people were really ready for everything and the other group were not ready. Now Jesus calls those people who are not ready as foolish. Those who are not ready, Jesus terms them as foolish. And then, let's see this. And uh, now, uh, verse 3. Those who were foolish took their lambs and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels uh, with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, 
the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Nine, verse 9. Then the wise answered and saying, No, lest they should, be, should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with them with him, and the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, As surely I say to you, I do not know. Know you. Verse 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. This parable, sometimes some people, they would have preached. And we also would have preached here. You would have heard. And you all know this parable by heart. Most of you, right? You know this parable by, by heart. What is this parable doing to you in your daily life? When this parable has been given by Jesus, he, he was pinpointing to believers to be ready on a day-to-day -day basis for the coming of the Lord. Now, the bridegroom is Jesus Christ himself, right? And as these ten virgins were waiting for the bridegroom, the church itself, is waiting for Lord Jesus Christ. Now when we are waiting for Lord Jesus Christ, we have no indication when He is going to come. We have no any dates. We don't know when He is going to come. But Jesus, when He gave this parable, this and afterwards another parable and another parable in the same chapter, you'll find. And before that, in chapter 24, He gave us the signs of the times. The things that are going to happen in the world towards the end. And the things that you are seeing, the things, the things that are happening in the world, they are a strong signs unto us. Particularly when you think about the, what's happening in Jerusalem and Israel, it's an important indication. Something will change now onwards in this land. It could be for good or for bad, we do not know. Certain things will be so strong and they will be, things will begin to happen so quickly and we don't know. And before that, what will happen is when things go absolutely wrong, the Lord's coming will be there. We are more closer than people 1,000 years ago or 100 years ago or even 10 years ago. When we are more closer, now what Jesus is telling to, uh, in this uh, parable is that these uh, five virgins who were not ready, they did not carry the oil with them. So, is it normally customary to carry the oil with them? Is it, is it normally done? Probably, yes. Because the other five people have carried their oil. Normally, it could happen, the bridegroom delays in certain kinds of weddings, maybe. So they were all were supposed to carry their lamps and go. That could be the custom in that place. But these people took it light. No, no, he will come. Doesn't matter. Just one bottle is fine. My lamp is full of oil. It's okay. By the time he will come, he will go. Why should we carry extra burden? Many of us as believers sometimes remain in that state where say it's okay. The word it's okay. In our language, parwa le duwa, parwa nahi. You know, it's all right. Chalega. It means chalega. Huh? I don't know. And that thing is a very dangerous thing. Even, even in your normal life, when you carry out your normal things, it's okay. Things will be all right. It doesn't matter. Now, our, our youth is preparing for the Christmas. You know, they are working hard. You know, it's okay on the day when we come, you know, just slight, slightly set it up. They did not say that. They are working hard. They want to make a difference in this place. They want to make something. So we, we old people need to learn from them now. Yes. Things must be done. 
preparation must be done. We must be ready. When Jesus has spoken to us so clearly, be ready because you do not know the day or the hour when I will return. And what he shows here is these five virgins who were not foolish or wise, they had their oil with them. Now oil is standing for anointing. Amen? Now anointing is what God wants us to live in. Because this anointing is the one who will lead us and guide us. Anointing is the one who will teach us the scriptures. Anointing is the one which helps us to pray according to the will of the Father. Anointing is the one that will keep us in the way of the Lord, not missing the mark. Anointing is the one by which we can preach, we can share, we can share the gospel to somebody. It's all that you need is anointing in your life. Anointing is with which you can do your business too. You can carry out your works in your offices because who said this to me now? Ah, CG said that. How he got his answers for his questions. We all are supposed to be living our life with the help of anointing and Holy Spirit Himself. You know, take this scripture. You know, get this uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. It's a very, very powerful scripture, and we forget about it. It says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. What does it say? You, who? Now, the Word of God says, You have an anointing in you. The Word of God is telling you, assuring you, there's anointing in you. Do you know that? The Word of God is assuring you. And because you have the anointing, you, have, you know all things. You are not uninformed. You are not ignorant. You are not someone who do not know what God wants you to do. You are a person, you know all things, what is right, what is wrong, everything that you know because anointing is inside of you. There's another scripture uh, I was going to take later. Let me say that. Why, how do you know that you have anointing in you? The very day you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you get baptized, means you totally surrender to Him. Acts chapter 2, 38 says, then you will receive the gift of Holy Spirit. It is an automatic gift. Automatically, the anointing comes and resides inside of you. Okay, hold it there. Let me go further. Furthermore, this is more exciting about anointing. Next verse, same chapter, verse 27. 1 John chapter 2, 27. But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you. Okay, you don't, not only received it, it abides. You know what it means of abides? Stays with you all the time. The same anointing which you received when you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior stays, abides with you, in you. And you do, you do not need that anyone teach you. Do you get this word? No, get this, get this, something in your heart. You don't have to always wait someone to come and teach you or you, you have to go to Bible school or church or something. Anointing is able to teach you and lead you and guide you. And this blessing is for every single believer. Just get this word. What it says is, but the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you and you do not need that anyone teach you. But the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie and just as it has taught you, you will abide in Him. Don't live in doubt. Don't let your thoughts go here and there. Understand something very, very clearly this morning. The anointing is the one that will teach you 
Ev- concerning everything in your life. Every decision that you have to make. Every step you have taken in your spiritual life, in your family, in your children, your education, whatever may be. When it comes to making decisions, the same anointing will give you the ability to discern things in the spiritual realm. You'll know things. Because the anointing is residing inside of you. You know this word, Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. I, I quote it so often, but let me read it one more time. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let's leave the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit means walking in the teaching in the learning from the anointing. What the anointing teaches you, learn from him, walk in that way that he taught you. Walk in the spirit means thus, because he will teach you, he will guide you, that's what we learned. He will teach you concerning everything. So, if you walk in that way, and Amplified Version says, walk in the dictates of the Holy Spirit, then what you will do is, you will not do anything that hinders your spiritual growth. You will not walk in the flesh. We walk in the flesh because even though we have anointing, even though we have the Holy Spirit in us, what we are doing is we are letting this Holy Spirit to be on one side. We are making ourselves on the other side within ourselves. We are making a partition. Let the Holy Spirit there I will make my own decisions. I will do according to my feelings, according to my flesh, and I will do all these things. Therefore, I'll fulfill my own. The word lust means not always lust. Fulfilling your own desires, your thoughts, and your plans. We all have our own plans, and we want to do our plans every day. Because God's plans are difficult for you. Because God's plan says, prepare an ark. Will you, are you willing to prepare an ark? Mm-hmm. God's plan is prepare an ark. Are you willing to prepare? No, no, I, okay, it doesn't matter. God can save me somehow. He says I'm righteous now because he's, he will save me some way. He will protect me. That's what we are thinking. And that's the reason, even though we have anointing in ourselves, even the Holy Spirit dwells and resides in us, we are not really walking in the Spirit. That's what is our problem is. Church, this morning, your preparation, it totally depends on walking in the Spirit. And your, your preparation depends walking under the power of anointing. In other words, you need to be so thirsty and hungry for anointing. You need to be so demanding on, on a day-to-day basis for anointing. My question to you is, How many of you, just be true to yourself, how many of you ask and beg the Lord, I need more anointing, Lord. How many of you do this on a day-to-day basis? I'm not asking you to raise your hands. Question yourself. Are you asking God, Lord, without your anointing, I cannot live a victorious life. Without your anointing, I cannot make into the eternity. Without your anointing, I cannot even do any ministry. We do lots of activities in our life. There are lots of Christian activities, church activities. We try to make so many programs in the church. It feels good, it's nice, it's all fine. But that's not the end of the ministry. At the end of the ministry is for yourselves to be saved, enter the kingdom of God. That's the final thing. And on the way, you are supposed to take many with you to the kingdom of God. If you are a person preparing, what you will do is, you will somehow win some souls on the way. When, you know, as I, said, as I mentioned to you, no, I was talking about what God has plans. You were talking about his neighbors, all his friends, all his people. Similarly, what you are doing, if you do not share with somebody, because that spirit, when, see, when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, the first thing happened to me was, I wanted to talk about it. Every day, I meet people. I just not only want to talk about my Holy Spirit experience, I want to talk about this Jesus who is real to me. Because when I experienced the power of God in my life, I began to feel, this is the real God. I mean, I, was, I knew Jesus from a young time, but that time, He became real to me. I began to share with people 
I used to work in the hospital. If I met people, my patients, which I, don't, I didn't care which religion, what they are, I got a little op opportunity I'll share. That's what tells fruit bearing. When you bear fruit, when you win souls, you're a fruit bearing person. And only those who are under the power of the anointing, they will bear fruit. And if you do not bear fruit, according to John chapter 15, you'll be cut off. And that we cannot handle. If we are cut off from, the, from the, our, our source of strength, we can do nothing. God is looking for them who are fruit bearing. Jesus is looking for, for those who are fruit bearing. Now this anointing, I'm using the word anointing all the time. Sometimes you may be thinking, what is this anointing? It is the power of God dwelling inside of you. Do not, even though you say the scripture, Acts chapter 1-8, so many times you are not understanding that anointing when it comes, power comes into you, power of God. What do you get? Power of God means... When you have power of God, you must live a powerful and victorious life. We sing lots of victory songs, all these things. But when it comes to living, even small things, small problems, when they bring fear into you, I'm telling you, you and I, if you are living in fear, we are living a powerless life. Means we are not living in the anointing. Is that right? Fear. When things, when you're shaken about the matters, problems that are coming in your life, when you're shaken up with those things, maybe a sickness, doctor told you, you have this sickness. Immediately, now what's going to happen? What's my tomorrow? What happened to my family? What's happened to my health? Or some things you hear like, oh, there are, in your company, people are being, you know, you're, you're, they're terminated because their company is going to close. When you hear this news, what's your reaction? My God will supply my needs according to his riches. It does not matter if my company exists or not. It does not matter if the world exists or not. As far as I live, my God will take care of me until the end. Isn't that right? So that kind of thing will happen to you when you are living in the power of God. You know, when Jesus, uh, let me read this Acts 1 8. But you shall receive power. But you shall Receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now I ask you a question. Do you have Holy Spirit in you? There should not be a question. Because I already mentioned to you, Acts chapter 2, 238, the day you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, Holy Spirit is already inside of you. But there is a problem. We do not invest time in getting filled with Holy Spirit day after day. We need to be filled. The oil is there when oil is getting burned. These virgins, these ten virgins, other people had oil to replenish. That's the problem. That's the reason Jesus was telling the story. The other people's oil finished. The end of it. Do you continuously filling your lamp? That your lamp may burn. It's a continuous process. If you want to live under the anointing, there is no shortcut. The only way is to wait in the presence of the Lord. We all have a big time problem waiting in the presence of God. I, I, I'll, I'll continue to say and stress again. The only reason we are not living victorious life, we love God. Most All of you or most of you love God. They want to do the things of the Lord. One thing we don't do. Our prayers are need-based. Everything is need-based. If I have a need, we'll pray. When the need is less, less prayer. Sometimes I say it's good to go through difficult times in our life. Because our prayers increase. Our closeness to God increases in your difficult times. And that's the time you begin to know the love of God and His goodness in your life. Prayer should not be need-based. Prayer should be to be in the presence of God and to receive His anointing every day, day after day, day after day. You must be filled with the anointing. With the anointing comes 
gifts of the Holy Spirit that will manifest in you. Why, why only one or two or three people manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit in this house? Why not the whole church? Can I make this bold t- statement? You're all not walking under the anointing. Is that right? Why? Why some gifts should not manifest in your life? It could be anything. One of those nine gifts in the whole gifts of the Spirit. Why are you not manifesting the gifts of the Holy Spirit in your life? Are they not given to every single believer? According to His will. Maybe one of the gifts. And if you are only speaking in tongues, don't tell me I have the gift of tongues. Don't tell me. That's gift of tongues. That's not the gift of tongues written in uh, Corinthians chapter 12. Gift of tongues is different than you speaking in tongues and worshipping God in tongues. That is different. That's another subject though. The gift of tongues is prophesying in other tongues which should be interpreted. That's what his gift of tongues is. That's what is connected there. Gift of tongues and then interpretation of tongues. These are needed. These spiritual gifts are given to the church for the edification of the church. So the church should be full of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Every single person in this house must be. If you ask me what's the vision, if you, I mean, we talk about a vision a lot. If you ask me about the vision, if I need to have a vision, first I'll have a vision for this church. And this church, that vision is every single member of this church must be walking under the power of the anointing. Everyone can lay, a child should go and lay hands on a sick and the sick must be healed. And when you go see a person suffering on the street, you will go touch him, lift him up and say in the name of Jesus, walk. And that man walks. That's what you can do. I can do. That is the power of the anointing that has been given to us. It's nothing less. There's nothing less. The the power of anointing is not less, little, more and more. It's we operating in it by faith what it matters. Can this church be that church? This is my dream. Can you all stand with me and say, yes, we will all be anointed, walk under anointing. Week after week, we'll come here to worship God in spirit. Today, we, we all felt like we're all sleeping in the worship. Yes. If you like it or not, I'm telling you, we felt like we we're all sleeping. Maybe some of us slept too much. We don't want to open our mouth. We don't want to be excess, uh, active and praise God with all that He has given to us. Under the anointing, you'll praise Him differently. Are you with me? Under the anointing, the way you worship Him will be different. Something maybe late night last night or we ate too much or whatsoever. We are not walking in the anointing, brothers and sisters. We as a church need to get this vision. If you ask me again, I want to tell you vision for this church. Every single member in this church must be under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You must walk in the Spirit. You must fulfill the works of God. You must do a science and wonders. Miracles in your lives must be a common thing. Miracles should not be any more miracles. Because they're common things. Because God is doing. You are not doing miracles. I am not doing miracles. Miracles will happen to others, those who look from outside. Because for us, it must be a normal thing to do the works of God. God said, you will do this. You know what Jesus said to us? John chapter 14, verse 12, he said, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will do also, and greater works than this he will do, because I go to my Father. The qualification to do the works Jesus has done is one simple thing. He who believes in me. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? Then what does it say there? If you believe in Jesus, you will do things that Jesus has done. Greater things than these also you will do. That's your share. That's your part as a child of God. See, in in, uh, in book of John chapter 1, verse uh, 12 says, All those who believe Jesus, they have become, they got the authority to become sons and daughters of God. You're all sons and daughters of God, aren't you? Come on. You are like Jesus. Jesus is son of God. Do you know that? So his share, your share along with Jesus has been given to you. 
That's the reason Jesus said, I'm going to go. That's chapter uh, 14, verse 12. John chapter 14, verse 12. So what he says, because I'm going to the Father. I'm going to Father. But while I'm gone, you have to carry out the things which I did while I was with you. Are you with me this morning? You have any feeling in your heart, I need to do the things what Jesus has done while he was alive on earth? Do you feel that today? Do you feel? And it's possible? I want to tell you very clearly and straightforward. It is possible only if you believe. You will. The anointing is present in this place right now. Only you have to do is you have to receive by faith the anointing. The word of God says, you know, what it says is, <clears throat> even Jesus, even Jesus, he did things because of the anointing. Do you know the scripture? Uh, Acts chapter 10 verse 38. Acts 10 verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. Okay. Get some, some more. When you, when you read, you get some more deeper meaning. Only when you have anointing or when you walk under the anointing, God is with you. This morning, are you feeling that you need, you should have done more concerning anointing? Do you feel that? When you feel that, you need to act upon it. When you feel that, you need to act upon it. There's a simple way to receive your anointing. Refilling. Simple way. One verse. Luke chapter 11 verse 13. Luke chapter 11 verse 13. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Means, when you want to be refilled, what you have to do? Ask. Ask you. Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Do you ask him? Do you ask him? I want to ask you very intently, very intimately, I want to ask you, do you ask God? Do you ask God? Do you ask God? I'm asking this with, with this kind of conviction. Do you really ask God and God is not giving you? Are we making God a liar? By saying this, if he has given you, why are we not walking in the anointing of God with his power? Why are you living a powerless Christian life on earth? Brothers and sisters, you know, I would want to talk some more time. There's not much time left. But I want to talk more time. I want you to get to some place this morning where you will see, I need to get this anointing today. Are you there? Ask him in such a way. It's not for today. After good doing, are you, can you make a quality decision? I'm going to ask more. I'll, if you are spending 15 minutes in prayer, increase it to half an hour. If you have been spending half an hour in prayer, increase it to an hour. If you are doing an hour and an hour and a half, just begin to spend that quality time. The anointing comes only when you wait upon the Lord. means when you reach uh, to a place when you are able to forget yourself, when you are able to forget yourself and connect with the Spirit of God, that's the time anointing begins to move. Are you with me this morning? Your preparation begins with anointing. This year can end. You know, I was learning one more thing. God, when God wants to take us to the next level, He wants us to forget the past. Forget the former things. I'm going to do a new thing among you. Forget at what this church was last year. Or in year 2, 2017, 2018 when we reach, we got to be somebody new. And that preparation has to take place now onwards. If you begin to pray, Lord, I will not live this powerless life anymore. Lord, I have been living. Things are not happening the way they should happen with me. Why, Lord, I am not being fruitful in my life? This must be a question this morning. And get ready to receive anointing this morning as we pray. Because he is here, right? 
The Lord is here. The Lord is here, amen. Is the Lord here? If you believe, you must receive your power right now. Receive your Holy Spirit right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, begin to worship the Lord. Begin to worship the Lord and begin to ask Him right now. The, the only way you can get your Holy Spirit anointing is to ask Him. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you.